So we are also very pleased um, to welcome you all to our final symposium. Thank you very much for the opening remarks. Here you can see a picture of us. It's been quite some months ago and um, as you can see you just heard that we want to bridge the um, yeah the the ends of different disciplines and if you have a quick look at this picture you can see that uh, this um, allowed us to do so because there are so many different disciplines here. You can see all the fellows in the first row. Um, only two of them are missing. Um, is Madeline um, because uh, sadly she had to leave us early but happily because she got tenure tracked. And um, sadly also Vicke is not here today because uh, she's sick but uh, we will try She's connected with us. <laughs> um, the technic uh, possibilities make it possible and um, we will try to replace her as good as possible. And you will see us um, over the next couple of hours um, for the lunch break for different um, yeah, chapters that will, um, will take place and Hector will tell you something about them. Hello everyone and uh, welcome to this uh, symposium uh, of the Marsilius uh, John Fellows. Uh, we are really glad to have you here. Uh, we are very happy uh, to see so many faces. And okay, this uh, event is, um, is called From End to Beginning, an Interdisciplinary Adventure. And uh, probably you know these books uh, from your childhood called uh, Choose Your, uh, choose, uh, no, choose your uh, Own Adventure. You know it? books in which you can uh, decide uh, at the end of every chapter how it is conti how it continues and uh, this event is something similar like that because we want you to uh, to participate in our conversations in, in in the discussions and also in several things um, that I am going to present uh, very briefly we are going to start with uh, the chapter one, um, which is called uh, Unexpected Connections. And uh, this, uh, there we will um, introduce ourselves in a kind of, of chain of um, connections that we found in, during the year um, in our interdisciplinary uh, discussions. And then we, we are going to go direct to lunch uh, because this is a symposium and symposium means uh, a space of drinking and eating in which we can uh, converse and, and have dialogue in the Greek sense. So uh, it, was, it could be the chapter two, Food for Thoughts. And uh, after that, we are going to, uh, to have um, a panel discussion about heritage and the transmission, intergenerational transmission of different kinds of uh, heritage, cultural heritage, and also um, emotional and, and um, medical aspects of that. Uh, and following uh, this chapter three, this uh, panel discussion, we have a very interesting exposition or exhibition of uh, several things, a kind of mixel miscellanea of our interest. <laughs> and we also prepare in this framework a kind of um, uh, exhibition with uh, data art. Uh, we planned and we conducted a, a call we, we, uh, and we will um, ex uh, exhibit the, the selected um, posters that we, we got and you, are, you have to participate also here because uh, you can vote, you should vote your uh, favorite um, uh, poster according to three categories. There are explanations and we will uh, explain uh, th that uh, later. But uh, please remember the, the voting cards are outside. Uh, you can, uh, you can uh, have it in order to vote. And after that, we will have the chapter five, which is another panel discussion, but now about um, uh, about the black box, box of science, we want to, to open uh, the scientific uh, process and work uh, showing not only uh, the, 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 posi the, the um, positive part, but uh, the discussing uh, failures, errors, and other things that make uh, success uh, possible. So, um, and at the end, we will, in chapter uh, six, we will uh, discuss uh, some uh, final remarks about the, the event. So this is an, adve an adventure in two ways. The first way is uh, it is the result of our adventure, interdisciplinary adventure during this year as uh, Marcellus Marcelli Young Fellows. And this is also an adventure that we uh, offer to you 
and you, we invite you to participate in it. So uh, now we are going to go to the uh, first chapter, which is called Unexpected Connections. And there we, we, are, we try to, or we, um, we want you to try to find um, a connection, a line, um, Ariadna's thread in, uh, of interdisciplinarity in our um, research uh, in order to navigate in the labyrinth of interdisciplinarity. In, in this way, we are going to uh, try to connect our research topic in a chain of unexpected connections. So pay attention to the beginnings and ends of our expo uh, brief <laughs> expositions uh, and enjoy the, the chapter one. Um, hi, everybody. So before we start, I just wanted to let every, anybody know I uh, need a welcome table. If you haven't grabbed them, there are the ballots for voting for the competition of Data is Art. So there's going to be one vote per person. If you didn't have or you don't have it at lunch, just remember to grab one paper so then when you see the exhibition, you can actually vote. So now I'm going to officially start with chapter one. Um, so my name is Paula Arana Barbier. Um, and one of the things that I do is, or I think about is, everything has an end. Everything comes to an end. And when we're thinking about the end, usually, one of the last things we tend to question is whether we can be buried in the place where we grew up, where we live, or where we spent most of our years. Unfortunately, that is the case for a lot of religious minorities, particularly a lot of uh, Muslim communities I work with here in Europe. The issue of the cemeteries and the burials is a complicated one because the body itself, once you die, you're no longer technically a person, but you're not a thing on its own. So you, it's, it's a dichotomy that we cannot necessarily understand. However, there is violence towards the, the corpse. There is violence towards the dead. And not allowing people to be buried in the place where they spent most of their years, where they particularly feel they belong, can be considered an act of violence. That is what I do, that is what I study, and it is a connection, a very meaningful connection between us, who we were, who we thought these people were, and a very strong connection between life and death. Even after death, people have an inference to the bereaved. This is described, amongst other things, by the concept of generativity. People try to pass on their knowledge and their experience to the younger generations. The family audiobook works with the concept of generativity. Terminally ill parents can professionally record biography, biographical audiobooks to their children. Over the course of up to three days, they talk to trained journalists about their life and their illnesses. They report a great sense of relief to have created something lasting for their children. They also benefit from being able to talk to a stranger about their lives who supports them empathetically. In addition to offering medical care, palliative medicine is increasingly focusing on psychological and spiritual well-being of people with terminal illnesses. Studies have shown that biography work with patients has a positive influence um, on their quality of life and decreases um, depressive symptoms. The largest patient group in palliative care is people with cancer. And cancer is the disease I was focusing on the most over the last uh, few years. Um, so cancer can occur by chance over the lifespan of people, especially affect then elderly people, but it can also occur in an inherited context. And that is what why my work was focusing on. So um, uh, inherited context means that a genetic variant is passed on from parents to children, and by this increasing their risk of getting cancer. This means that especially this group of patients um, need um, a dedicated 
treatment, but also in particular prevention because of this increased risk of cancer. And, but in order to really have an idea of a good prevention strategy, you need to understand how cancer actually develops. And this is um, similar here to this tree slice where um, you have the whole um, tree in the end, you s but you actually don't know or you can um, depict based on this how the cancer developed and here how the tree has developed over the years, how different um, factors influenced this and so on. And this was actually my work, me as a mathematician working in the field of cancer, looking on how cancers developed and by using mathematical modeling. So using these models, I was able to um, help the clinicians and medical experts to develop better prevention approaches. And this in the end is part of current clinical guidelines that are in use nowadays. And by this means, these models could help um, clinical decision making in cancer nowadays. An innovative way to improve clinical decision making is the use of artificial intelligence. However, when we use artificial intelligence in medicine nowadays, a common concern that emerges is the dehumanization of care. Medicine has become more patient-centered over the past years, and the use of those cold data processing machines, this AI, can seem to run contrary to the rich human interactions that are the foundation of patient-centered care. However, I argue that quite the contrary is true. AI can be combined with patient-reported outcomes, reports that come directly from our patients. Not only does this help to incorporate the voice of our patients in clinical decision-making, but it ensures that those AI outcomes are tailored and focused on our patient needs. I'm a physician and data scientist working here in Heidelberg, and I'm working at the intersection of traditional clinical outcomes, patient-reported outcomes, and artificial intelligence. And I hope that my research over the next years, especially in the field of breast cancer, contributes to truly individualized, patient-centered, shared decision-making that empowers the use of AI in medicine. It's a bold vision, given that we currently do not fully understand our own human decision-making process fully. Human decision-making in uh, cancer treatment is, of course, a very special high stake context for decision making, but we actually all make hundreds of small scale decisions each and every day. And I am a psychologist interested in individual differences, especially individual differences in cognition. And I particularly look at how um, people make very fast decisions, so decisions that um, do not take longer than maybe a few seconds and how we differ in this, uh, proce these processes of decision-making. And similar to what Andre and Saskia have already described, I also use mathematical modeling and machine learning techniques, in my case, to better understand the processes underlying human decision-making. And in particular, I look at how these processes develop and change over the human lifespan. So are there age differences in these cognitive processes? And interestingly, um, what we find is um, people get slower over the human lifespan. When they get older, they um, take longer <laughs> to uh, make a decision. But what we find, according to our model-based analysis, is that a large part of this slowdown can actually be attributed to the fact that older people tend to use more information um, as basis for their decision-making and the actual uh, evidence accumulation process th itself does not slow down um, at least until a relatively high age. Yeah, so that's basically looking at the end of the human lifespan to a large extent. But on the other hand, there's also another period 
where there's great um, plasticity and development um, and that's towards the beginning of the human lifespan of course and it's not just in the cognitive domain but um, there's development all over the place <laughs> in childhood so it's perhaps not a surprise that um, there's also rather detrimental consequences to childhood trauma in this particular Yes, so Misha has just talked about small-scale decisions that happen every day and these everyday small-scale decisions can have large effects on one's health. Particularly parents' everyday decisions on how to raise their children may have enduring effects on their children's health. And um, I'm a psychotherapist working in the field of childhood trauma. So these enduring effects of, for example, emotional, physical and sexual abuse as well as emotional and physical neglect. So childhood trauma has been deemed one of the most important risk factors for mental and somatic health. Um, but not everyone who has survived abuse and neglect early in their life, so in the beginning of their life, um, will suffer from a somatic and or mental disorder later in life. So what's really interesting is to get a better understanding of the mechanisms underlying the association between childhood trauma exposure and later disorders, mental disorders, somatic disorders. And this is what I'm interested in in my research. And I'm using functional magnetic resonance imaging, for example, to get a better understanding of that. So my research focus is on childhood trauma, on uh, trauma by the hands of a caregiver. But obviously you can experience trauma in a lot of other contexts, for example, in the context of wars. Yes, and so wars are indeed about the most traumatic events we can imagine in uh, human history that often have a lasting impact on future generations, not only of the generation affected. As an international lawyer, I study how international law regulates the beginning and end of what we call armed conflicts. Interestingly, we often see that this development and influence is bidirectional, meaning law not only gives war a legal form, but also war um, influences the content of the law it tries to regulate. This became most prominent even in the field of the public domain um, with the so-called Bush administration's doctrine of preemptive self-defense, arguing that the United Nations Charter's right to self-defense would also um, acknowledge a right to preemptive strikes against the target even before the threat has been realized. My research analyzes the phenomenon through the lens of historical contextualization. It not only focuses on the black letter law, but also puts a context, uh, focus on the context and the interests of the acting individuals, as well as the overall social and political environment they are acting in. This suggests that modern wars are also fought to influence world order. In this context, language also plays an important role, especially when it comes to the interpretation of um, legal terms, as by means of interpretation we can fulfill them with different meaning. So, um, as a social linguist, I am uh, interested in um, uh, language and migration. And migration is one of the most common consequences of war. Uh, but in fact, mobility is also one of the constants in human history. And it causes go uh, beyond, beyond conflict, of course. Uh, individuals and groups uh, of people move with the languages and coming into contact uh, with other languages along the way. Beyond their linguistic communities, beyond their national borders, uh, many languages are abandoned, lost between generations, while many others are maintained and other uh, languages transform and born. The interplay between uh, intergenerational transmission of mother tongues and the acquisition of new languages, together with the dialectic between identity and integration, makes following data unsurprising. 99.8% of the world's countries are multilingual and more 
than half of the human population is bilingual. So multilingualism is uh, not an exception. Probably monolingualism is a kind of exception in, uh, in our um, actual world. And this multilingual reality prompts us to rethink whether linguistic where linguistic communities begin and end, especially when we consider the role of language in identities and in cultures. I will now tell you a little bit about Vickers' research. Researchers have long acknowledged the fundamental role of language in our understanding of the world around us. Specifically, language is closely connected to what is commonly known as culture, the collective of our ideas, customs, and social behavior. This is also the case for the queer communities in Indonesia that Vicka works with in the context of her research. Different local and globalized terms are used amongst activists to describe a wide variety of gender and sexual diversity. Having shared labels and words helps to form a sense of community and organize for the common cause, for example, in the case of queer activists. On the other hand, having just one label, such as queer, to describe a variety of people also risks obscuring the diverse needs and challenges faced by different individuals and groups, such as queer women, transgender men, or cisgender gay men, or the different future desired by them. Paying attention to how the formation of different identities and groups leads to different outcomes is therefore crucial to her research. Establishing identities and forming groups is not only important for humans, like in Wiki's research, it's also important for the tiny units that make up all organisms. I'm talking about cells. It's especially important in the early development of organisms, the beginning of their lives. Embryos develop from a single cell into something with a front and a back, a head, a tail, and organs in all the right places. During the establishment of these spatial structures, cells move around. They come together and they move away again. Even though this cellular dance seems to be highly orchestrated, there is no conductor. And many of these processes are due to interactions between the cells themselves. To understand how such large collections of cells move about and how they signal to each other, I use mathematical models, which are especially suitable to describe how patterns form in space. I'm fascinated by how these mathematical models and equations can actually help us understand the biological world. However, the real magic happens when we combine these models and these simulations with experimental data from my colleagues. Applying both the theoretical perspective with mathematics and the experimental approach really allows us to understand a single problem in a more deeper way. And we are applying this approach, this combination in particular, to unravel the rules by which these cells play and how they manage to form structures out of randomness. Yeah, the emergence of structure from randomness is not just common in living things, but really all things surrounding us. And interestingly, um, during the scientific revolution and even before and after, many of our theories uh, didn't focus on living things, nor even uh, our immediate surroundings, uh, but really things out there on the night sky, right? Stars, galaxies, uh, etc. And so astrophysics is the discipline that tries to make sense of these and physical processes that are involved. And particularly as a computational astrophysicist, I try to, um, to model uh, these kind of natural laws. So one particular approach that we use uh, commonly, or I use commonly, is so-called universe in a box simulation. So we really try to convert most of the physical laws that we think are relevant on the larger scales to machine code. Um, we run this machine code on some of the largest supercomputers that we have, and then we can study the outcomes that form galaxies and structures um, from the initial tiny density fluctuations in the universe. And ultimately, 
right? Uh, with this, we can then compare these outcomes, these simulations of galaxies, to um, observations of all what we see on the night sky uh, and ultimately understand um, yeah, how things evolved from uh, the beginning of the universe nearly 14 billion years ago.